neutrinos. This has been missing so far in my lectures, but of course you have had lectures on neutrinos and uh, how to detect them. So I try to be relatively brief and uh, emphasize a little bit the detection side of it, not so much the, the physics side of it. Now, neutrinos are good because they are neutral, they point back, so we can do absorption, and also they are not easily absorbed in the matter between the source and us, so we can even look inside the sun, you know, and see what's happening there, or inside uh, clouds and, and, and active galaxies, uh, and, and we can see what happens there. But of course, this is also a curse because they are difficult to detect. If they don't absorb, if they don't interact very well, they don't interact very well as well with the detector materials. And so that makes this a big negative thing. You know, you need huge detectors in order to capture a few. So we will see. Now, the basic reactions that produce neutrinos, they're all weak interactions, of course. Um, are this, a neutron decays into a proton plus an electron plus a neutrino. That's a classical beta decay uh, process by which neutrinos were discovered in the first place, and they happened like that in nuclear reactors, because in a nuclear reactor we break up a heavy nucleus into smaller ones, the heavy nuclei are neutron rich. So if we have two smaller ones, there are spare neutrons that are bound to decay. And so we, we have here a source of antineutrinos. I think you're familiar with the concept of particles, antiparticles. So here the lepton number is zero. That means also here the lepton number has to be zero, and the electron conventionally has the lepton number plus one, so this must be an antineutrino. And of course, it's an electron antineutrino here. Now, you could reverse that, you know, bring the proton to the other side and the neutron to here, and uh, so basically you have a, a proton decay into a neutron, an electron, a positron and a, and a neutrino. That does not happen for a free electron because the mass of the neutron is higher. So that can only happen in a reaction and such one such reaction uh, is happening in the sun where protons uh, are converted into neutrons. Two protons are converted into neutrons and four protons together form a helium. Yeah? So these go together. For nucleons, two of them have to be converted into a neutron with this thing here. And that works only if this proton this has energy that can uh, overcome the higher mass of the neutron. So in the sun, for every fusion reaction, we produce uh, two protons into two neutrons, and that means we produce two neutrinos in each of these reactions. Then there are other reactions. You know, you can get them from these by kind of regrouping something. So for instance, if you have a proton that swallows an electron, you can have that. It's called electron capture in an atom. A proton in the nucleus can interact with an electron that is close by or even coming <coughs> through the nucleus. You can convert that into a neutron plus a neutrino and you have, uh, th this is basically the main process in a supernova uh, where protons and electrons are squeezed so heavily by gravitation that it's better for them to go together and form a neutron. Yeah? So the neutrons need much less space than the protons and the electrons predominantly, so the star can contract further on. And with protons and electrons stabilizing a star, we get stars like our sun, which are relatively big. Once the protons and the electrons go together and we have only neutrons, 
will have a neutron star and the neutron stars are much smaller. So for instance, a one or two solar mass star with 150, well, I don't know, with, with millions of kilometers diameter can shrink together to a neutron star with 15 kilometers diameter, the same mass inside it. So this is an important process for the supernova explosion. But whenever you have a lot of energy, this reaction can happen. E plus E minus uh, can interact into a photon, and a photon kind of decays into two neutrons, neutrino, antineutrino. And also that is important in the supernova because you have this huge energy, and this is the only process by which particles can leave that. Yeah? So if you make E plus E minus going to, in, to quark, antiquark, or E plus E minus, uh, the particles can't get out. Yeah? The dense core around it you know, is so dense that nothing gets through apart from neutrinos. So in this collapse phase, we produce 99% uh, of the energy, of the gravitational energy of this collapse into neutrino, antineutrino pairs, which then kind of go off. This is like a, a steam valve in a, in a pressure kettle, you know. The valve is what lets the energy out, and it's this reaction. So you see, we can produce antineutrinos, neutrinos. Uh, other processes uh, that produce neutrinos are decays via weak interactions of mesons, which on their side have been created by hadronic interactions. So we have seen the pions as prominent examples. They decay into muons plus neutrino, muon neutrino this time, uh, pi, pi minus and mu minus plus <coughs> muon antineutrino. And, um, and also we have the muon decays. This is leptonic, a lepton into a lepton. And now we need here two neutrinos First of all, an electron neutrino to go along with the electron, and a muon neutrino to go along with the muon. Now, sorry. OK, so of course, protons and neutrons are not fundamental particles. They consist of quarks, and effectively, what is happening here, a D quark is converted into a U quark, or a U quark is converted into a D quark, uh, and along with this goes, goes this neutrino production. So the weak interactions uh, kind of deal with quarks, and the same thing here, the, the pi plus consists of a U D bar, and the pi minus of a U bar D, and also there, this reaction kind of converts one quark in, into another. Yeah? And in this case here, um, you convert, so to say, the, the U quark into a D. Then you have a D, D bar. And that can kind of annihilate and produce energy. And the muon and the neutrino escape. OK, so these are the sources. Ah, and here's the other uh, uh, hadronic reaction, which I meant to, to mention before. So effectively, this is D to U, or U to D, uh, or U plus electron goes into D plus this. So you can write that on the quark level. And uh, these here, which are purely leptonic, uh, they don't need quarks. They just uh, mediate between the leptons. OK, so neutrino properties. Uh, there are three species, electron neutrino, muon neutrino, tau neutrino, and we can prove that these are not the same. So if we want to make an interaction that requires a muon neutrino to come in and do something and create a muon, this doesn't work with electron or, or tau neutrino. These have only the weak interaction. No charge, no strong interaction, just weak interaction. They show parity violation, and they are left-handed on production. 
uh, largely left-handed neutrinos, largely right-handed antineutrinos, which means spin is anti-parallel to momentum or spin is parallel to momentum. Now, these neutrinos, via the reactions I've shown here, can made into beams. We can put a proton on a target, then pions are created. We select some of them, we let them decay, and there we have a neutrino beam. Yeah? And um, we can select the charges by magnetic fields, we can select the, the momenta, and accordingly we get, a, we get narrow uh, beams of, of various neutrinos. Yeah? So we can, depending on how we do that setup, can select muon neutrinos or electron neutrinos, and we can, can do experiments. And with these experiments, we, for instance, can measure the interaction strength of neutrinos, and uh, the cross-section which describes that is very, very small. It's 10 to the minus 44 per uh, square centimeters. It goes, it scales with the energy of the neutrino, and um, so for MeV neutrinos, this is about the number. Typical cross-sections for strong interactions are 20 orders of magnitudes higher. Yeah? And electromagnetic cross-sections are, uh, you know, a few orders below the strong, but still also about 15 orders of magnitude higher than that. That's why neutrinos are interacting so weakly. Now, we have seen we can produce them and we can detect them by letting them interact. And that means we can investigate them. And here are a few uh, specific experiments uh, for neutrino physics. This is the Super Kamiokande detector in Japan. There was first a smaller version of that, the Kamiokande detector. Both were caverns underground filled with water and lined with photomultiplier. You see here people cleaning the surfaces of the photomultipliers. They are relatively big, and there are 12,000 of them in this cavern. This is 70 meters high, 50 meters across. And the cavern is then slowly filled with water, ultra pure water. And now you have a huge volume with water molecules and a neutrino passing through once in a while interacts there, either with the electron or with the, uh, with the nu nucleons inside. And when it interacts, it makes electrons or muons, you know, or it changes a quark into another quark. And that gives a reaction that deposits energy in the water the particles that are produced create Cherenkov light in the water, and the Cherenkov light can be detected by all these detectors. And then an event looks like this. So each point is one of these photomultipliers, and uh, simultaneously, all of a sudden, things like that appear, you know. And you recognize here a ring. You know now what that means, you know. For a short distance in water, a charged particle was traveling creating Cherenkov light. What's the refractive index of water? 1? OK, other suggestions? 1.3, yeah? So it's relatively big. In air, we had a refractive index of 1.0001 or something like that, yeah? But water has a strong refractive index. That means there are lots of Cherenkov photons produced, and the Cherenkov angle is relatively big. In air, it was only about a degree or so. That's why we get this long shower, 20 kilometers long, and the footprint is only 120 meters radius. Here, it's of the order of 45 degrees. Yeah? So we get nice and clear rings, and we can reconstruct that. We can work out where the particle come for, came from, the amount of Cherenkov light, again, is a sign of the energy of the, of the neutrino in the first place. And uh, well, maybe I should just write that down. So the neutrino comes in, 
it interacts and produces an electron and uh, gives some of its energy to this electron and goes on, you know, so. And this, ener this electron has some more energy and can go off and does Cherenkov light, yeah? So here the neutrino is not absorbed, it just gives off some energy and we call that, uh, so to say, an elastic scatter. But then we have, for instance, something like that. Yeah, so a neutrino can be absorbed on, an, on a u-quark, make it into a d-quark, and create an electron, and then this here gives us the Cherenkov flight. Yeah? And you can have similar reactions with, with muon neutrinos, so you dissipate, you create particles that, uh, that can produce Cherenkov flight. Now, with this detector, uh, neutrinos could be observed that come from the sun. Yeah? The sun is a big neutrino source, and uh, they know at any time where the sun stands with respect to their detector, and so they were selecting, uh, the, the, they were working out the direction of the neutrino from the Cherenkov flight, they get the direction of the electron, and the electron's direction is linked to the direction of the incoming neutrino. And then is this what they get, you know? They see that there is an excess of such neutrino events coming from the direction of the sun, and from other direction there is a flat distribution of neutrinos, so if you were to extend that, it would go here. So clearly here you have this, this excess. No? And, um, this is the best fit to the data. This is what a model without neutrino oscillation would predict. Yeah? So the best model shows there is an excess of, of neutrinos. And so this here is an image of the sun in the neutrino light. That's quite cool. So since we have such measurements, we know that there are neutrinos produced at mass in the sun. But there's a deficit, and such a deficit has also been observed before in a dedicated solar neutrino experiment that didn't link every individual neutrino to the sun, to the direction of the sun, but that was a chemical experiment, and that found as well that there is a deficit. Initially, one thought the experiment was done wrong, or the standard solar model was wrong that gave the expectation or the nuclear physics used for the analysis was wrong. But in the end, it turned out neutrinos oscillate. Yeah? And so, for instance, the electron neutrino that is produced in the sun, on its way, kind of is converted partially into muon neutrinos. And uh, this was a, a very worthy discovery. It got a Nobel Prize for that and, and also this, this experiment saw the same thing. So in the end, it was clarified, it is indeed oscillation and not these things here, and uh, we, there are various ways of observing those, not only with the solar neutrinos. The Sudbury Neutrino Observatory in the end clarified that because it was devised in a way that not only these reactions could be seen, but also these. And I have to add here now something. So this reaction here can only work with electron neutrinos. If this is an electron neutrino, then we get here an electron. So if this neutrino kind of changes into a muon neutrino, this reaction with a muon neutrino and here a muon cannot happen because the muon mass is very heavy and the electron, the, the initial neutrino, does not have enough mass to create 
the muon. But this one here, this works with any neutrino because the neutrino uh, does not need to create the corresponding meson. It just stays the neutrino it is. So even a muon neutrino or a tau neutrino could kick out an electron and make a signal. Yeah? So if we have oscillations that this goes into uh, a muon, we don't see a corresponding event. But here, these events can, can all be seen. And this SNOW experiment, Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, could do both detections. Yeah? It could detect these things here, yeah? and it saw a deficit here, but then it could also detect those, and, uh, and there was no deficit visible, so it was clear the neutrino is not vanishing completely, it is just changing its identity. And this is, so to say, a summary of the various neutrino experiments before that found a discrepancy between measurements and, uh, sorry, measurements and expectations. And then with snow, this first interaction here showed a deficit as well. But the second one, where all the neutrinos could participate, showed that the neutrino level is as expected by the solar model. So neutrinos do oscillate, and that means they have mass. And I'll be brief on that because you have heard all that before. So we can work out the probability to convert from one type into another, and it depends on the mass difference, on the length scale over which we observe from creation <laughs> to detection, and on, on the energy. Now, also with atmospheric neutrinos, you can observe that. So say we have here an underground detector in Japan, and uh, we have learned that cosmic rays rain down on the atmosphere around the globe. In the air showers they produce, there are pions, they decay, there are muons, they decay. So we're producing lots of uh, atmospheric neutrinos. And they can come down from the atmosphere to this detector, but also from this side because their chance to penetrating the Earth is practically one. Yeah? A very, very small fraction only is absorbed. And now, you know, these people here can, can look at where the neutrinos come from and can, can check whether they see an asymmetry. So this is showing it again. So these are the atmospheric neutrinos, uh, and they can be detected here. Forget now for the moment for the astrophysical ones. And so uh, what is shown here now is as a function of angle, you know, if they could look upwards, they see a very short piece of Earth. So the atmospheric neutrinos are created close by. If they look downwards, the atmospheric neutrinos are created 12,000 kilometers away. And somewhere here sideways, you know, there's a, all the distances in between. So this this angle here, cosine of the angle here, basically me means the change between overhead and beneath and everything in between. And so here you see that uh, for the electron-like neutrinos, you don't see much difference. The black dots are the measurements, and the red and blue are, are models for with oscillation and without oscillation. But for the muons, you see a substantial difference. Without oscillations, you would expect that. But you see this. So there's a market deficit here. And also here, uh, without oscillations, you would expect that. And, uh, and you see this. So also in the atmospheric neutrinos, you can detect that neutrinos are oscillating. Or here it's shown in a slightly different way as a function of the distance. Yeah, uh, you see that for small distances, all agrees, but then the oscillation kicks in, and for large distances, you see a clear, a clear devi deviation. So we know now neutrinos do have mass uh, because they oscillate. Uh, we don't know what the masses are because oscillation experiments depend only on the mass difference squared. 
And so we could have a scenario where the lowest mass and the second lowest are relatively close together. This is what you probe with solar neutrinos, and that the second and the third are relatively far apart. This is what you probe with atmospheric neutrinos. You see the one is 10 to the minus 3 electron volt squared, and this is 10 to the minus 5. It's about a factor of 100 smaller. But it could also look like that, that these are the the atmospheric ones, you know, the lowest and the second lowest, and this is the solar ones. So which hierarchy nature has chosen uh, is a, a topic of, of research. Several experiments are being built right now to measure that, and uh, the experiments deep in the ice can help as well. There, additional strings are now brought down so that you have can measure neutrinos down to a few GeV, and also then, with their reactions, you would get an oscillation pattern that could let you dist uh, distinguish this and that scenario. OK, now, uh, in the 80s, uh, some theories predicted that possibly the proton could decay. You know, grand unified theories would treat leptons and, and baryons the same way. There should be a transition possible. Uh, you know, it, it seemed rather reasonable to assume that. So experiments were built to search for the proton decay. It's clear that protons are relatively long-lived, otherwise we wouldn't be there. But still, they could be decaying with a very, very long lifetime. And these experiments set out to, to measure that. And you can do that by not observing one proton and wait until it decays, but you have very, very many protons. And since the decay curve would be an exponential, you know, you should see a few decaying in the next year or so. So Kamiokande, the first Kamiokande detector stands for Kamioka, that's a village, neutron, no, nucleon decay experiment. They observed 3,000 tons of water IMB in the United States, 10,000 tons. The Mont Blanc in Italy, 90 tons of liquid scintillator. And Baksan in Russia, 3,200 uh, liquid scintillator detectors with PMTs. And they all looked for that. They stared into this volume, and they were expecting some little blip from a proton decaying into, say, a pion and an electron. This is similar to what you would expect to see from a neutrino interaction. Yeah? You, you create an electron that has a little bit of energy, and uh, you go underground, that you have a quiet environment, and then with these detectors you can see that. So no proton decays have been seen. Uh, by the way, there have been generations of other detectors later on. I think the current proton lifetime is known to be larger than 10 to the 34 years which is 10 to the 20 times the age of the universe. So this is pretty long. But they have seen neutrinos. In the year 1987, a supernova in the Magellanic Cloud exploded. This is very close to us. And these detectors saw neutrinos three hours before the light of this explosion reached the Earth. Yeah? Kamioka, 11 in 13 seconds. IMB, 8. Moblo, 5. Baksan, 5. Yeah? So quite exciting. No background is possible to do that. It was clear, you know, otherwise they had one event per month or so. And now they had 11 per second, per 13 seconds, yeah? or one per second here. Yeah. So it was clear that was linked to this neutrino uh, explosion. The neutrinos they saw had typically MeV energies, what you expect from a neutrino from a supernova explosion, and uh, they traveled with speed of light. So you could investigate what is the spread. Are the heavy ones fast and the energetic ones faster than the not so energetic ones, and so forth. So this was very nicely analyzed to death, more, more or less, and uh, 
it's clear that these neutrinos came from a supernova. Since then, we are all desperately waiting for more nearby supernova. Uh, in our own galaxy, the last one that was observed was in 1600, observed by Kepler. Yeah? So we are long overdue a decent supernova explosion in our own galaxy. And there are plenty of detectors around that would now see from such an explosion not 10, but 10,000 neutrinos in a very short time interval. OK, so this was the image of the sun. Then the supernova gave us neutrinos. And these were the two only neutrino sources in the sky we could experimentally verify. Both had MeV neutrinos. So, you know, we knew that uh, if cosmic rays go to 10 to the 20, there will be neutrinos of higher energy, but we could not detect them. So these were the only two sources for more than 30 years. <coughs> but it shows that neutrinos from astrophysical objects can be detected. So you can do neutrino astronomy. It's just a matter to do the right detectors. Yeah? And this is what I showed before. We see cosmic rays of 10 to the 20, so there must be neutrinos also above an MeV. And I, I mentioned already that a few years ago, indeed, the energy range around 100 <coughs> GeV to you know, a few T, PeV could be explored by, um, by the ice cube experiment. So in a supernova, 99% of energy goes into neutrinos. Uh, there are many other objects that produce neutrinos. So you know, they come to us from wherever, and uh, we have to find a way to detect them. And I've also shown you this. So very early on, there was the idea to use water volumes for that. And the first idea was to go into the deep sea of Hawaii, and a project was called Duman. So you put detectors on a long string, you sink it down to a few kilometers depth, and you try to see what's happening in the water volume. Uh, it was unsuccessfully largely due to technical reasons. You know, there's high waves in front of Hawaii. So if you have a string dangling on for a few kilometers and the, the ship is lifted up by a wave, your string snaps, so you'd have a special ship that is not moving, and so forth, and so forth. Anyway, after several years of trying and failing, uh, they were cut. They didn't get any funding. But the idea was taken on by people who wanted to do it in a different way. So here, the Russians, or I should say at that time, the Soviets, uh, they used the Lake Baikal in Siberia. It's a very deep, sweet water lake, and it freezes over in winter. So that's nice. You, know? you drive with your truck onto the ice, you drill a hole, you sink a string, and you let it stand there, and you come back next winter and pull it up, you know, or you know, repair it and then you leave it again for a year. So they have done that, and indeed, it's still ongoing and it's being extended, albeit slowly. But in 1994, they saw first neutrinos. And they detected them by having these strings, and they see light coming from beneath. So a particle comes out of the seabed. It creates Cherenkov fly. The Cherenkov fly propagates across the, the photomultipliers, and you see a characteristic time signal. In parallel, um, in the Mediterranean Sea, Antares and then later on KM3Net are propagated. Uh, so these are a prototype for a big cubic kilometer uh, undersea observatory. And they had a few strings at first, and also they started to see neutrinos. And before that, Amanda in 1995 was a first string or first few strings deployed at the South Pole. There we have a permanent ice shield. 
and you can drill a hole basically with a hot water hose two and a half kilometers deep and sink the strength in there and also there uh, they they saw neutrinos and they vigorously uh, built up the whole ice cube and in 2010 uh, they had one cubic kilometer ice instrumented and since then data taking is ongoing so here is ice cube here are these strings uh, in total uh, 86 strings of about 50 uh, optical modules. Each dot here is an optical module on the string. This is the size of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, so this is the cubic kilometer. And it's deep down. This is just electrical you know, cables uh, because all the light coming from above and all the cosmic rays should be absorbed before you come to this sensitive volume, which is very dark and very quiet. And here you see that they detected events. Uh, so each little dot here indicates one optical module. The color indicates the time when this module lit up. And um, the size of the blob indicates the pulse height. So we have high pulse height in the center, and so something is kind of propagating away from the center. Now, the size of it. This is about the size of a big football stadium, you know, 300, 400 meters across. And all those modules light up at the same time, within a few nanoseconds. So there must be something. There's no background that can fake that. So this is a real event. And the energy reconstruction gave that the neutrino that has produced that must have of the order of one peta electron volt, 10 to the 15 electron volts. OK, now I mentioned before, uh, IceCube is interested in astrophysical neutrinos, but these are those that come from AGNs far away. Uh, but there is this omnipresent background of atmospheric neutrinos. And it's very difficult. The neutrinos look alike. The cosmic rays go up to very high energies. So also the neutrinos that are produced in their showers can have 10 to the 15 electron volts. And uh, so it was difficult to, to be sure that there are astro astrophysical neutrinos among them. OK, I show you here optical module. So 50 of those are on one string. This part here is a photomultiplier. Yeah? Of course, this has to be in a pressure vessel. If you are at three kilometers depth, you know, you have about uh, 300 bars of pressure. So a fragile glass PMT would be squashed. So you have to have a very strong glass sphere that can stand the pressure. Then up here is the electronics. And then one of the cables is the connection to, to uh, the top of the ice, uh, where high voltage uh, and electricity and the, uh, is sent down and the data are sent up. Yeah? So in total, they have 86 strings of 60 optical modules each. And here you see the hole that has been drilled with hot water. And now one of these strings is sunk down. And you have to be quick, because when you draw out a hot water hose, the thing starts freezing solid again. So you, you let it down, and two days later, the, the hole is solid, and there's no way to remove it anymore. So luckily, the deep temperatures and the construction of these things have been such that over the years till now, very, very few of these uh, sensors broke and can't be used anymore. OK, so here are the various uh, signatures that you can get. If a muon neutrino interacts, you produce a muon. The muon travels largely unhindered on a straight line. And along its track, it produces ionization and Cherenkov flight. So here you see such a track. Yeah? It's elongated. There is a time gradient in the color. And wherever the, the muon goes through, some of the the modules fire around. Uh -huh. This is 10 TeV, relatively low. 
If you have 6P EV, then you produce more Cherenko flight and it doesn't look as nicely collimated as that. Obviously, these guys don't fire here because not so many Cherenkov photons are produced, but the ice is also not totally transparent and there is some scattering going on. Yeah? So here you have a lot of light, so you can scatter it sideways and uh, it's looking a little bit broader than that. But still, this is a clear muon, as you can see from the timing. If an electron neutrino interacts, it produces an electron. An electron produces an electromagnetic shower in the ice. And this is rather spherical. The electromagnetic shower in ice is only perhaps a meter or two meters long yeah, before all the energy is, is uh, dissipated. And that's why these showers here basically look more round. It's very difficult to determine a direction from it. But it's easy to determine the energy because you contain the shower in the detector. If we go back uh, here, you know, the muon, uh, there's an arrow, it's downward going, starts here, or we start to see it here. Yeah? But the muon could have started over here and would have lost energy on this way, which we don't see. We can only see what is dissipated in the eyes. So with the muons, we have very good directional determination, but a poor energy uh, determination. So basically, the energies we determine from muons are only lower limits. The neutrino energy was larger than the energy that is dissipated in the ice, because it lost energy here, and it may lose energy there. And here, if the shower is nicely contained in the detector, we get a very good energy measurement, but uh, the, the direction is poor. And then the third neutrino, the tau neutrino, that would produce a tau lepton and would dissipate some energy locally here. But the tau lepton at high energies can travel a long time. The tau lives only 10 to the minus 12 seconds or so. so at low energies, it instantly decays at the same place where it's created. <coughs> but if the energies are high, then the tau can, can travel. You know, Its lifetime is prolonged by a gamma factor. And uh, so at high energies, the tau can have 300 meters to travel. So you would see here the first bang when the tau is born, and then the second bang when the tau decays into hadrons, we create again some Cherenkov light. So if you see such a characteristic double bang, then you know you have seen a multi-PEV tau neutrino. This is a simulation. Uh, so far, these have not yet been discovered unambiguously. So, and here, another picture. So this is a, a track. This is an electron shower with very high dissipation in the middle. And, uh, and that would be a simulation of a tau neutrino. Here you see now something coming in, and there it's starting with interactions. The rank of light is produced, and you get the various modules fired. Yeah? So now you can reconstruct when, where each module sits, when uh, the, the optical modules are fired, and like that, you can work back where it come from and what the energy was. This is now an event from August 9th, 2011. It's a roundish, shower-like event. Again, size of a football stadium. And uh, this, the energy of this one was 1 PeV, and the energy of the first one, maybe we don't get that here. No, we don't get that. So these are real events that have been measured, and that was once the highest energy event observed. So. Um, 
Then finally, in November 2013, scientists were confident enough that indeed, at the highest energies, there were astrophysical neutrinos. And the background of atmospheric was small enough that one could claim that. They had evidence larger than five sigma, and it was a great paper, and it was uh, named the breakthrough of the year in 2013 by Physics World. This is, by the way, the, the camp at the South Pole where the ice cube data taking is in, and then a bit further away is where the, the, the extra experiment is. And they looked at the spectrum, and here you see, uh, as a function of energy, how many neutrinos you would expect from the background. Background atmospheric muon flux. Yeah? So the blue and this red thing, this is what you would expect from atmospheric neutrinos, and this is what was seen. So you would expect that the atmospheric flux falls with the spectrum like the cosmic rays. And you would expect that astrophysical neutrinos have a harder spectrum. So at high energies, they should dominate what one sees from the background. And indeed, that part here constituted then the, the few sigma excess, uh, which made people confident that this is really astrophysical neutrinos. <coughs> this is, meanwhile, the highest uh, measured event. It's 2.6 PeV deposited energy in the ice. So probably the neutrino has produced it is about 9 PeV. Yeah? And now people are looking for more of those events to investigate the high energy end. So 2013 can be seen as the birth of neutrino astronomy. For the first time, neutrinos from astrophysical sources have been seen. So now if you measure a longer time and you look where do they come from, you know, uh, these various symbols here are track-like events, these are cascades, uh, and the, the, the crosses are starting tracks. These are neutrinos that, that where the shower ev evolution starts within the, um, the ice cube detector, so they are relatively well measured. But you see, this is rather diffuse. There is not a prominent source. There is no sign of a galactic disk. And so uh, the neutrinos must be, must be extra galactic. Now, you could say each neutrino points back at its source because it's not deflected. If I see a neutrino coming in here, the source must be there. But because the directional reconstruction is not very good, you can't pin down what the source is especially if you see only one neutrino. If you were to see 100 neutrinos from this direction, then you could kind of resolve it. And um, still now, we don't see a source, a clear source. We see a diffuse background of individual neutrinos coming from everywhere. And that makes it very difficult to interpret that. And people were already kind of frustrated about that. So. It's a situation where most of the sources that contribute to the neutrinos deliver zero neutrinos being observed. A few of the sources sent us just one detected neutrino, yeah? and none so far gives us two or three or four neutrinos. We would like that, one strong source that sends us a neutrino every day. Yeah? That would be great. You could do something with it. But so far, this is not the case. And since neutrinos reach us from the whole universe, you know, there are many sources far away that possibly could send us this one neutrino we were just observing. So not much to learn about that, initially quite frustrating. Now, you could say, well, what are the possible sources? Maybe these HENs the bl of blazar type, which have a jet pointing at us, or gamma ray bursts, you know, and what one could do, one could say, how are our neutrinos we are measuring distributed in the sky? How is it correlating with a population of HENs or a population of gamma ray bursts? And this was done, and unfortunately, neither gamma ray bursts nor blazars dominate the, the neutrinos we are seeing. 
Yeah? So these are upper limits that says at most 27% of the neutrinos we see can be from blazars, and less than 1% can be from gamma ray bursts. So what the hell are the sources of these neutrinos? Yeah? So it's quite puzzling. Now, at some stage, people thought, well, if something flares, there's a good chance that during that flare, they are emit, emitting also a big number of neutrinos, and then maybe one or two are detected at Earth. And so uh, the various collaborations started to alert each other. And IceCube set out an, an alert system that whenever they saw a high energy neutrino appearing in their detector, they sent out a note and said, hey, we have seen a neutrino of PV energy from this direction. And then other instruments can look whether they have seen something in that direction uh, at the same time. Now, just looking in all neutrinos you measure, you can see whether there is perhaps a hotspot. Yeah? And this is the highest accumulation of neutrinos, but still it's 44% chance to be by, by random. So that you don't see here great, great sources. You just see statistical fluctuations. Now, you could use IceCube data to look at neutrino properties. And as before in Supercam Yokande, also here you see indications of uh, oscillation as a function of incoming angle. You expect this without oscillation, and you see this, and it's matching nicely the prediction if you assume that neutrinos oscillate. And same thing here. So you can determine oscillation parameters, and here the dashed and the blue line are ice cube results from the first event. Super K has put these red lines, and the green contours are from Minos. Meanwhile, ice cube is improving on that, and the contours shrink. And uh, rather probable, the oscillation parameters are here at a big mixing angle and at this mass uh, squared, dif different of mass squared uh, of about 2.5 times 10 to the minus 3. Now, after three years, uh, with some extra strings, the so-called deep core area, you see that the, the ice cube contours have shrunk from this blue contour to the green one. And also here, it is in more or less good agreement with other experiments. So can detectors be improved? Of course, you can build a larger volume, not just one cubic kilometer. You can have denser detector spacing for lower threshold. With that, you could do the neutrino hierarchy. You could, on top, build a better array to veto cosmic ray showers coming in, because some of the muons in these showers penetrate deep down and may cause a background, and so forth. And, uh, and of course, you can do this alerting of other exper uh, experiments and react at the same time to transients, so to gamma ray bursts or outbursts of vetoes. And this is what Gen 2 of IceCube will be. It's a pie in the sky. A first funding has been done to deploy a few more strings here, but to enlarge the array, to enlarge the top detector array, uh, and so forth, is still outstanding. OK. So I click over here. So to summarize what the neutrinos have been achieved so far, we can use it. We see it from astrophysical sources. Uh, we have to get better in, in identifying the sources. We wait for another supernova explosion uh, and so forth. We are now beyond the PEV range. And we do not see it, or at least we didn't see it until the year before last, a bright source. We do not know what these sources are. The most promising candidates have largely been ruled out. But it's still early days. You know, only six years after the first discovery of uh, neutrinos from astrophysical sources, uh, we are just in the infancy of this technique. Yet, 
In the last two years, we have seen a nice set of results by combining different messengers, combining neutrino measurements with gamma rays or gamma rays with gravitational waves and so forth. And in the combination, we hope to be able to better investigate these sources. So you all aware are of multi-wavelength observation. So there are radio telescopes, optical telescopes, X-ray, gamma ray telescopes. Finally, you know, the, the highest energies, the Drenkov telescopes. And they look at the same sources and they see different aspects <coughs> of it. The radio telescopes see relativistic electrons, optical telescopes see thermal emission, and the highest air telescopes see shock acceleration and relativistic particles. But all these are photons. Yeah? So that's why it's all photons with different wavelengths, different energies. But we can also observe neutrinos or cosmic rays or since recently gravitational waves. And when we combine these with that, then we call that a multi-messenger observation. Yeah? So the things we measure are complementary if you measure that from the same source. But we can also measure at the same time. So if one observatory sees an outburst of something and everybody else looks at that point and sees as well something, then we, we have contemporaneous observations and that, that is very helpful. And just to show you what synergies <coughs> exist, all these are photon observations, yeah? radio frequency, low far, uh, whatever, there is a multi-wavelength array in Australia, uh, SCAR uh, are coming, you know, uh, here are further radio. SCAR is a big square kilometer array being built. Uh, there are many different projects that look at radio frequency. Yeah? And at sub-millimeter radio, there's ALMA, this recently was, was finished, and a few more to come. This is just radio. Then optical, all the big telescopes, you know, uh, the European extremely large telescope, GMT, uh, the J James Watson telescope, space telescope, HST, Hubble Space Telescope, still there, but ending at some stage. X-ray, many satellites, gamma ray satellites, Fermi, some ground-based, you know, new ones to come up gravitational wave experiments, neutrinos and ultra-energy cosmic rays, all give data, and in the combination of all these, uh, we will certainly learn a lot. So I told you that Fermi was looking for variability, and it saw that uh, when making a movie out of the sky plot for every day, you see things popping up you know, and vanishing again. And this guy here, well, now it's not coming anymore. This is the Crab Nebula, okay? I told you in one of the earlier lectures that the Crab Nebula was uh, seen as a standard candle and then turned out to be not what's happening now. Okay, so they started to look at the sky, at the sky to see these variable gamma ray sources in GEV and uh, some interesting stuff there, you know, as a function of time. And then at some stage they tried to feed in the high energy neutrinos. You know, when the neutrinos were seen to show that in that movie and to see whether something happened at the same time. And then lo and behold, oops, a 22nd September 2017, here a neutrino was seen and at the same time there was in gamma ray a flare from that part of the sky. Coincident in time and space, so that is probably uh, a common origin. Now, they sent an astronomer's telegram. They alerted everybody. Shortly after, the magic gamma ray telescope saw also 
an excess from this position now above 100 GeV, okay? So here we see a neutrino, one single neutrino, okay? But then Fermi sees an outburst in the GeV range and Magic sees an excess at, three, at uh, above 100 GeV. So that was a great event. That's the event seen in neutrino. So it's coming in here, going out there. There's a track-like event. And in the real uh, stream, real-time stream, it was seen. It was seen. It's a big event, and the alert was sent right away. And then all the rest came after. Fermi reported an activity. Now Fermi has a good location, and it was quickly realized that this was a known object, TXS0506, that was a blazer that was known already and had some variability in the past. Swift observed an X-ray. Assassin observed the light curve of this blazer. Archile. Uh, here now the magic result. On 4th of October, yeah, so several days later, uh, they, they could see this excess at 100 GeV. Swift again, and so forth. Goes on and on and on. Yeah? On one of these things, these alerts, where really something is to happen, usually hundreds of those uh, follow-up observations are presented. So that was great. Now, of course, IceCube had neutrinos in its archive from the years before, and they were looking back. You know, this was this recent event with gamma ray counterparts seen to it, and they were looking back, and they found that from that position in the, in the sky, they saw an enhancement of a few events within a short time, two weeks or so, but no electromagnetic counterpart at that time. But if this guy here is part of this outburst and had already uh, an enhanced emission of neutrinos in the past, this is very telling. But unfortunately, since here no photons are visible, it's kind of puzzling to interpret what source that really is. Anyway, this is for the first time an observation of one event, of one outburst seen at the same time in gamma rays and in neutrinos. So here we see neutrinos and gamma rays are indeed linked. Now, we all have heard about the discovery of gravitational waves. This was the first event where the two detectors in Hanford and in Livingston saw such a, a a, a chirp, which is indicative of two black holes merging together to one. So whoop, and that's it. And they could say that this is two so black holes of 29 and 36 solar masses, respectively, merging together. It's very far away, a billion light years away. And they could locate it roughly to within this shape. Now, this is huge. Yeah? It's very difficult to, to locate that with such an uncertainty. This is many, many square degrees. <coughs> but then, sometime later, again in 2017, uh, a neutron star, neutron star merger was observed. And so here you see uh, the, the chirp, the gravitational signal, weep, and gone. Yeah. And a little bit later, a few seconds later, you see from the same position in the sky a gamma ray burst, the light being emitted from that merging event. Now, if you have two black holes, a black hole is quite a, a uniform thing. It doesn't have you know, anything around. The black holes probably have swallowed every material in their environment, and if they go together, it's just getting one bigger black hole. There's nothing there that could emit photons. But with neutron stars, there is, because a neutron star has a skin of normal matter around. And you can imagine that in the merging process, this normal matter is heated up or is you know, chucked out or can, can produce a light signal. And here we see that for the first time, a gravitational wave signal has also been seen in gamma rays. 
And here is what the Fermi error box was, you know, for the signal. Uh, this bananas here is what LIGO and, and Virgo together uh, constrain where this thing comes from. So this is the position then where follow-up optical observatories have located this, uh, this, this supernova type signature with a, the high emission that fades away then quickly. So for the first time, there's a follow-up in the optical and there is a combination of gravitational waves and gamma rays. And also here, uh, you see uh, how things went. This is the time axis since the merger. So the gravitational event happened here at zero, basically. Then integral observed, then Fermi observed, then all the others came in. Yeah. The Cherenkov telescopes observed as well, but 10,000 seconds later. So this is about three hours, three hours later. But they didn't see anything. But that's important too. You know, if you're constrained, there's nothing at 100 GeV or above, that's important too. And this type of observations is what we mean by multi-messenger. It's transients, you know, it's, people say, yes, look here now and then. Um, and then everybody who can is observing that. And from the combination, you can learn about the processes in these things. So with new instruments, with more gravitational wave observatories, with better telescopes, uh, we, we hope that we will see many, many more events. And from each single event that has such a multiple observation, you learn much more from, than from 10 events with only, which are only observed with one observatory. So I summarize, astroparticle physics is an exciting field. It's very versatile. The highest energy particles are rare, and they are difficult to detect. You know, it's an experimental challenge, but we are getting better. And uh, the high energy particles tell us what is going on in high energy sources and very violent sources. And, uh, and that's exciting, physics at the border to the unknown. The most energetic cosmic rays, gamma rays, and neutrinos, and gravitational waves come likely from the same most violent environments. You need the energy in, in the first place before you can pump it into photons or cosmic rays or neutrinos. And as such, we have here four new windows, relatively new windows, into astronomy, TeV gamma rays is only 20 years old or so, less than 20 years old. Neutrinos, less than six years old. Cosmic rays is quite old, and we have good high-energy experiments, but uh, they are not good enough. We would like to have something that is much more sensitive. And gravitational waves, we don't know how that will go. Surely a lot of interesting results will come out of each of them and especially out of the combination. So there's a bright future with many challenges and uh, good opportunities for bright young scientists. Now, let me conclude with a quote from Steven Weinberg. He wrote a paper called Four Golden Lessons for Young Physicists, well, for every physicist, but especially for young ones. Now, experimental, and he talked then about uh, particle physics. Experimental findings and theoretical ideas do not yet form a coherent and clear image. The situation seems very messy. Yeah? And this is the most productive environment. If you have a topic like mechanics, mechanics is more or less understood. Yeah? You don't read about cutting-edge research in mechanics anymore. This is all written up in, in textbooks. But here, in particle physics, at the front end, in the search for dark matter, in astroparticle physics, there are lots of open questions. And we have no clue. We see experimental evidence of something and have no clue what the origin of it is. Yeah? So that's a messy situation. And my advice is to go for the messes. That's where the action is. That's where you can learn most. So experiments and analysis are challenging. They require young people that are bright. And uh, 
I'm sure over the next 30 years, by the time you're retiring, perhaps, lots of the questions we are scratching our heads today will be answered one way or the other. And maybe you can be part of it. Thank you very much. You mentioned that a uh, mu beetle would help the uh, ice cube reduce ice cube background. What kind of beetle would you like to include? And if there is another uh, reason to don't do that except for economical reasons, of course. I'm not sure I understood your question. Um, so if, you mean the, the muons coming from above? Yeah, you mentioned that a mu beetle would reduce the background in ice cube. What kind of beetle? Well, the ice cube detector sits down here under the ice, yeah? two kilometers deep in the ice. And up here are particle detectors, the ice top array. Yeah? So that means if there is an air shower from a cosmic ray forming in the atmosphere, falling on that array, there might be a few high-energy muons created in that shower that make it down to here. Now, IceCube could detect those, and it would perhaps say, well, this is something comes from above, so we don't classify that as a neutrino. But the IceCube measurements are getting better and better in distinguishing, you know, say, events that come from here. Can that be an air shower from over there? Or is that a neutrino? The atmosphere is getting relatively thick. So IceCube is working not only to, to record muons that come from below, but also use these. And you could do that by having here an array that is extended. Yeah? So if you see a downward going muon, but there is nothing here in these detectors, then probably it was not an air shower. Yeah? So in a sense, the air shower array up here can be used as a veto. Whenever this, these detectors see an air shower, you say, OK, at that time, something came from above. So we assume it's an atmospheric neutrino and not uh, an astrophysical one. Yeah. Hi. Um, in the slide where you show us the mass uh, hierarchy of neutrinos, uh, what does the color bar size means? Which one was that? Do you know the number? Uh, 271. 200 and something, yeah. That helps. 71. Yes. Yeah, so uh, you mean, oops, you mean these bars here? Yes, the size yeah. of it. So we know that every mass eigenstate is some sort of combination of the electron neutrino flavor, muon neutrino, tau neutrino flavor. And that is indicated here. Yeah? So look here. This is delta mass atmospheric. Yeah? And this is going from something that is uh, electron, sorry, muon neutrino largely into electron neutrino. No, sorry, this is tau. Muon neutrino in, in electron neutrino. Yeah? Is muons produced in the, uh, in the atmosphere, and then a neutrino goes through and a muon is detected on the other side. Whereas here, uh, the atmospheric thing, again, you know, is, is red to green. So it indicates that each of the mass eigenstates has a different combination of flavor eigenstates or vice versa. And that you usually show as this matrix of mixing matrix where you have to fill all the, the parameters in the end. Yeah? So they contribute differently 
to the different mass eigenstate. And that is indicated by that. I'm not sure whether that is quantitative, but also this is only qualitative. You know, this thing here is 100 times larger than this. So just take that as a qualitative sketch. And here the colors indicate the amount of electron muon tau neutrinos. Uh, I have another question. Did you say that the cross sections depends linearly in, on yes. the energy? Yes, yes. And uh, if that's the way it behaves, why is it so difficult to detect high energy neutrinos? It's still small. <laughs> yeah, it is still small. But it's an important point. I said that solar neutrinos can go through the Earth without doing anything. Yeah? And actually, the large majority of MeV neutrinos would go through the Earth without any interaction. But if we go to higher and higher energies, the neutrinos have a chance to interact. So if you go 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16, neutrinos would not make it through the full 12,000 kilometers of Earth. So there, you find to, uh, uh, to you, you see that directional dependence shows up and, uh, well, I'm not sure, yeah. You know, when, when the energy gets high, these guys here wouldn't make it through. You only see neutrinos perhaps from here and here from this direction. If you go to even higher energies, you would only see neutrinos coming from this direction. But you can work that out, you know. It's many orders of magnitude that the energy has to rise before you see a noticeable difference. Yeah? You can calculate for what, for what energy, you know, the chance to go through would only be 10%. Yeah, do that as a homework. Okay? Yes, um, I think you mentioned that um, the uh, oscillation experiment of uh, neutrinos always, I mean, oscillation of neutrinos experiment always give the square uh, masses differences, right? Yes. So are we able to measure the absolute, uh, absolute masses? Well, not with these experiments. Not with these experiments. Initially, people tried to measure the absolute mass of the neutrino by looking at the beta decay spectrum, for instance. Yeah? And if there was a, a reasonable mass, you would get some kind of cutoff towards the end. There's now an experiment just getting ready to do that again with much more precision than was possible before. But um, so far, these experiments have not been sensitive enough to come up with a, with a real result. And it may well be that the new one, again, only will be an upper limit, that the masses are smaller than this and that. Yeah. Can, I, can I comment yeah. on that and summarize? So, because I, I've been a student shorter ago than you, I guess, and I was very confused. So the way I tend to remind, to remind it to myself is that, in principle, you cannot measure a mass, right? Because you measure neutrinos only through interaction. Right, so it has to be an interaction eigenstate that you're measuring, and as Carlos was uh, the other day was uh, summarizing it, you basically look at disappearance or something or appearance of something in the flavor, right? That's the oscillation. The oscillation gives you the delta mass, right? And so you get two delta masses, which is obviously related to three masses. That was exactly the slide that Johannes was showing. But then you only have the delta masses. You don't know how the masses are organized. Is it the small delta m? Is the big one minus the two, right? So that's the way you, I tend to organize the thoughts. I don't know if that's useful, but that's, that's the way I tend to remember it. So you can't measure the mass directly because that's not measurable because it's not an interaction eigenstate. Johannes, so we um, are discussing large detectors with, uh, we try and maximize detectors for their energy and their angular resolution, but there are also tabletop detectors, for example, in gamma rays. And I was just wondering what kind of role we can expect those to play 
in future in future detection methods? None. None. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on you, you know our experiments are measuring the very highest energies that you can't get otherwise than from astrophysical sources. And uh, you can't do that on the tabletop. You can't make an accelerator that give, goes to 10 to the 15 or 10 to the 20 electron volts. You're talking now about tabletop experiments of I'm thinking, for example, edges or something like this. One of these ones in like Australia, which looks at radio. So, probing early universe, but without the high energy particles. No, I, I don't know. I I can't say, but I would say that in the moment you're interested in the high energy end of this of the spectrum, uh, there's no easy way to get high energy particles and do experiments with it other than with uh, with very big detectors. In yeah. Don't forget, this is the last chance to ask questions to Johannes because there will be no discussion this afternoon. Okay. <laughs> the threat helped. So, two questions. First one is, are neutrinos expected to come mostly from transient events or most steadily flux of neutrinos. Well, I think you expect neutrinos to be produced steadily, but also enhanced in a flare, like photons as well. You know, you have a steady emission, and then whoops, all of a sudden the emission goes up by a factor of 10. The point is that if a, a source is in the high state, it is easier to detect for us, for our detectors with a limited detection threshold. If you had a perfect detector, you know, you would measure as well the steady emission. But if the steady emission is under what we can see, then the flare still may bring it up to what we can see. And then we look at the flare and then we say, oh, we need a better experiment to see also the steady emission. One sees always only the brightest. There's a very nice experience that all of us have. If you go out at night, when the sun is setting and you look for the stars, you see a first brightest star appear. Well, it's probably Venus or a planet or something. Then it's getting a little darker. Then you see Sirius, or I don't know what the corresponding is in the southern hemisphere. But you see the brightest stars first. And then more and more fainter stars become visible. And this is always the case if you look at infrared sources or x-ray sources, there's always the brightest. And we would have all bet a substantial amount of money it would be the same with neutrinos or with ultra-high energy cosmic rays. We thought there must be a brightest source. And with Auger, we are sensitive enough to see the brightest source. And there wasn't. There was just one event here, one event there, one event there. Why no brightest source? source. And you can only explain that by assuming that the brightest source is still so weak that we do get only one neutrino from it and not more. So, you know, most neutrinos it sends out go somewhere else and only one hits the earth or our detector. And we have to wait a thousand years before the second neutrino comes <laughs> that, that we, we could register. So, and that's why we are hoping for the transients. In the transients, we can get all of a sudden a flux for a short period that is 10 or 100 times higher. Or in an in a explosion, you know, a typical gamma ray burst or a supernova explosion, the object gets brighter by many orders of magnitude. And if then we can detect it, then we have learned at least something. So the following question is, the amount of neutrinos coming from a direction could indicate us if it, the source is local or galactic or extragalactic? In principle, yes, because the number of neutrinos we see 
goes like 1 over r squared. The further we are away, the fewer we will see. Uh, now, if you have one event that sends us five neutrinos, that alone doesn't tell you how far the source is away. Yeah? You would need to have a measurement of a line, a shifted line, that gives you the distance. Or you would associate the source with a galaxy, where for the galaxy you know what the distance is. From the neutrinos alone, you don't know. Has it been traveling from our own galaxy to us? Or has it been traveling from the end of the universe? Any more questions for Johannes? So um, I was wondering if there is a, uh, you know, when you have a gravitational wave, then depends, depending on the distance of uh, the, the object that is produced, uh, you could uh, have somehow a attenuation of the amplitude, right? Well, it's also a type of one over R thing. The further you are away, the more diluted is the energy, yes? Okay. So my question is, uh, is that taken into account when yes. they uh, consider the correlation with the gamma rays uh, signal, signal? Well, the correlation and coincidence, that means the signals appear at the same spot in the sky at the same time. Yeah? There, you don't necessarily know whether this is one event or whether it's two events. Say the gamma ray event comes from here, from something, yeah? but the gravitational wave event is much further away, originating from a merging black hole. But it's rather unlikely that these two, exactly on the line of sight, happen at the same time. So we believe, if we see that at the same time, the same location, that it's coming from the same origin. So if the gamma ray measurements help us to identify an object that flares and the gravitational wave uh, event, you know, uh, happens at the same time from that direction, then you, you can combine that and can say this is the identical event. Yeah? You know, the concept of coincidence you all know from daily life, yeah? If you think about a friend from school times, and in that moment the telephone rings and it's this friend and say, hey, how are you doing? Haven't talked to you for 20 years. That's quite scary, no? <laughs> yeah. But if, if you think of your friend and three years later on a Saturday afternoon the telephone rings and it's your friend, you make nothing out of it, yeah? So there's always, in coincidence, there's always a chance probability that this happens just by random chance. Yeah? But if that chance probability is very, very small, you tend to believe that there is a connection between the two. And so you always have to work out what this chance probability is. I think it's a good moment to stop. Yesterday I used a lifetime analogy, but it was much darker than this one. So probably it's better <laughs> to thank you once again for uh, coming all this way and for your help and for your lectures. Let's thank you, Anas, again. <laughs> and we have a very small token of our great okay. gratitude well, for you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to give lectures here, and I hope that how many are here? 60, maybe one or two, make it to a career in astroparticle physics and maybe you win a Nobel Prize and then I can say, oh, this guy I know, I have taught once to him. Okay. For me, it's too late, by the way. Thank you very much.